good afternoon. A statement by John Swinney on an update on named persons. The Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills will take questions at the end of his statement and there therefore should be no interventions or interruptions as was the usual practice. Call the Deputy First Minister. 15 minutes, please. Presiding officer, since the Scottish Parliament was reconvened in 1999, there have been a number of issues on which it has spoken with one voice. One example of those issues is the importance of ensuring the best possible start in life for every child in our country. This Parliament has agreed on a number of occasions, over a number of years, and across different administrations, that the Getting It Right for Every Child policy, or GERFEC as it is known, is the best way of promoting the best interests of our children and young people. I would like to take the opportunity to set out the principles which underpin the GERFEC approach and why they are so crucial in driving Scottish Government policy towards children. GERFEC is the national approach in Scotland to improving outcomes and supporting the well-being of our children and young people by offering the right help at the right time from the right people. It supports them and their parents to work in partnership with the services that can help them. It puts the rights and the well-being of children and young people at the heart of the services that support them, such as early year services, schools and the National Health Service, to ensure that everyone works together to improve outcomes for a child or for a young person. It is an agenda that enshrines the principle of early intervention that was championed by the Christie Commission and embraced by this Parliament and several of its committees over many years of its inquiry. Fundamentally decent aims and ones that this Parliament has endorsed uh, repeatedly on a cross-party basis. Aims which have been welcomed by children's charities and the teaching and the nursing professions. And it is against that backdrop of a shared commitment to children's well-being that the named person service was developed. It was through the recognition, based upon real-life experiences and expert advice, that a timely and early offer of advice or help can prevent troubles from becoming crises, and in some cases, crises from becoming tragedies. The GERFREC approach is one that works. It was taken forward in Highland, where the value of the named person role as a central point of contact was first identified by parents and rolled out across the authority between 2008 and 2010. Since then, more families have been receiving additional support and more quickly. This means that there has been less need for compulsory measures and the needs of many children have not escalated. Between 2007 and 2013, the number of referrals to the Children's Reporter in Highland dropped from 2,335 to 744, a drop of 68% in these complex, sensitive <coughs> and costly processes. The number of children on the Child Protection Register and the number of looked after children has been sustained at 15 to 20% lower than prior to the GERFEC approach being introduced. Moreover, social work caseloads have been reduced by up to 50% from previous levels, now averaging around 15 at any one time. Accordingly, early intervention is getting more support to more children and those who need higher levels of intervention are also receiving that. Those figures represent progress but the arithmetic represents something far more valuable. It represents the opportunity for young lives to be improved at an earlier stage and significantly so. Those are the benefits that we want to bring to the whole of Scotland. While I accept that political support has not been universal, there has been and continues to be broad political and stakeholder support for the policy. However, the named person service has been subject to a legal challenge which has cast uncertainty over its scope and its legality. Although both the outer and inner houses of the Court of Session upheld the, the provisions of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014, on the 28th of July, the Supreme Court determined that ministers needed to pro provide greater clarity about the basis on which health visitors, teachers and other professionals supporting families will share and receive information in their named person role. They ruled that the information sharing provisions of part four of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 are incompatible with Article 8 of the Con European Convention on Human Rights and that changes are needed to, to make those provisions compatible with Article 8 to ensure respect for one's private 
and family life, his home and his correspondence. In recognition of the changes that are required in the legislation, I laid the necessary orders to pause commencement of the relevant parts of the Act to ensure that all provisions were not commenced as intended on the 31st of August. Since the Supreme Court judgment, I have provided Parliament and key stakeholders and practitioners with regular updates on procedural progress in regard to amending the legislation. I welcome this opportunity to bring Parliament up to date with the next steps that will be taken. Crucially, the Supreme Court ruled definitively that the principle of providing a named person for every child does not breach human rights and is compatible with EU law. The Supreme Court also described the intention of the policy as unquestionably legitimate and benign. They rejected the petitioner's argument that the legislation relates to reserved matters. So the attempt to scrap a service which can bring benefits to young people and their families in different areas of Scotland failed. And this Parliament, which passed the necessary legislation on a cross-party basis, with no votes against it, was vindicated. For the avoidance of any doubt, the Government remains absolutely committed to the named person service. The Supreme Court judgment does not dilute our commitment, but it has required us to revise part of the legislation to ensure that it is compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. We want the legislation to achieve exactly what the Supreme Court says it needs to achieve, compatibility with Article 8, along with greater clarity around the information sharing provisions. I'm keen to commence the provisions of this Act as early as possible. However, I'm also keen to pursue an inclusive approach, one that takes this Parliament, stakeholders and the wider public with it. We recognise that information sharing has been an important issue for practitioners and the public alike. We want to ensure that there is a clear consensus across Scotland on how information sharing should operate. That must include the essential principle of consent and the rare occasions when it is not appropriate to require or to seek it. That must be addressed through open dialogue. For that reason, the Scottish Government will undertake a three-month period of intense engagement in Scotland. We will take input from practitioners, as well as parents, charities, as well as young people, those who support the named person policy and those who have concerns about it. I intend to involve the offices of the Children's Commissioner and the Information Commissioner as we look to address the Supreme Court judgment effectively. In order to address the concerns raised by the Supreme Court, we will discuss the principles that should underpin the legislation and the development of a code of practice set out to set out how information should be shared under the legislation. This work will be taken forward by the Minister for Childcare and Early Years and by me. Once that engagement ends and we have an agreed way to proceed, I will return to Parliament and announce the next steps in terms of legislation. However, it is my ambition to work towards a commencement date for the legislation and these provisions of August 2017. Let me, presiding officer, address one final point. The judgment itself does not require current policy to change. The judgment relates only to the information sharing provisions that were intended to come into force under the 2014 Act, not to current practice under GERFEC policy. Any sharing of personal information that takes place now or in the future must be done in accordance with the Data Protection Act 1998 and the Human Rights Act 1998. A local authority or health board can nominate a person as the named person for a particular child and to arrange for that person to be responsible within the local authority or health board for the provision of services to that child. Organisations can, within the framework of, of existing law, continue to deliver or engage with existing or developing named person services. So my message to local authorities and health boards is a clear one. Please continue to develop and deliver a named person service in your area to make the benefits of the service available to every child who needs that service. I'm all too well aware of the debilitating impact that the peddling of misinformation has on practitioners and stakeholders. And I say to them today, thank you for your efforts in providing the best support network possible for every child in our country. Ministers know that what drives you every day is doing the best you can 
for the children with whom you interact. The commitment to the provision of a named person service has not wavered. The commitment to enshrining all aspects of the service in legislation at the earliest possible date following appropriate and inclusive consultation is absolutely resolute. As a parliament, we have made significant progress on the GERFREC agenda. That progress has been enabled and facilitated by cross-party consensus on what is important and how improvements to the life chances of Scotland's children and young people can be achieved. The Supreme Court judgment provides us with an opportunity to amend the information sharing provisions in the 2014 Act in a way that improves the named person service and reassures parents and practitioners and the wider public. It provides us with the opportunity to continue in the spirit of shared purpose and consensus to getting it right for every child. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy First Minister. Um, the Deputy First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow 30 minutes for questions, after which we move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now. I call first Liz Smith, to be followed by Ian Gray. Ms Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank uh, the Deputy First Minister uh, for prior sight of the statement. I wonder if the Deputy First Minister could provide a categorical assurance this afternoon that any local authority which was already implementing the named person policy prior to what had been the statutory implementation on the 31st of August and which was un acting under Scottish Government guidance was acting lawfully in terms of its data sharing practices. Secondly, and notwithstanding the fact that the Scottish Government is not obliged to provide its legal advice, what evidence from the Information Commissioner and other advisers made the Scottish Government so sure at the time of the Children and Young People's Bill that the data sharing aspect of the name person policy would be ruled compatible with Article 8 of ECHR when many legal experts, including the Faculty of Advocates, the Law Society, Professor Norrie and MSPs on the Education Committee raised serious concerns. And thirdly, given that the Deputy First Minister is urging local authorities to proceed with developing the policy, which in fact they can't actually do because they don't know what it exists. Could the Deputy First Minister tell us if he believes that the Scottish Government made a mistake by making a move away from the term welfare, which can be defined in statutory terms, to the term well-being, which has no clear definition and which as a result has lowered the possible threshold of intervention from at significant risk of harm to any minor concern about the child? And will he agree, finally, that the former chairman of the Education Committee, when he was challenged by my colleague Alex Johnson to define the term well-being, was entirely wrong when he said that this was a ridiculous intervention and nobody knew what they were talking about? Deputy First Minister. In, in relation to um, the first point that Liz Smith has raised, um, I set out in my statement the, the current legal position, which is that if any local authority wishes to provide this service, they must ensure it is compatible with the Data Protection Act um, uh, and uh, the uh, requirements of the, the Human Rights Act in 1998. So those are the, that's the legal framework within which the local authorities must act in designing their schemes. And the point I was making and the distinction I was making in my statement is between the provisions which were made within the Children and Young People's Act 2014, which clearly the Supreme Court have said required to be altered. And you know, that legal framework has not come into force. That has not been enacted. It was to come into force, and the Supreme Court have said it cannot come into force unless that is revised. So local authorities must um, vest their schemes in the existing legal framework that precedes that, and I cited the basis upon which that should be done. Now, on the second point that Liz Smith raised, and I'm glad that she put the caveat in that we don't reveal our legal advice, because we don't reveal our legal advice. But I would point out to, to Liz Smith that the that Parliament considered all of these issues when it legislated in 2014 and came to its conclusions. Uh, the bill was then, the, the Act was then tested in the outer house of the Court of Session and the inner house of the Court of Session, and the legal challenges were dismissed in both of those courts. So I don't think it's fair for Liz Smith 
to say that somehow um, the government has not taken due care and attention in taking forward this legislation because we've had it tested already in two courts, the, the two highest courts in Scotland, and have found and the legal uh, challenges have been dismissed. But the Supreme Court have taken a different view in relation only to the information sharing provisions. And I think if we look at the, uh, the, the decision and the judgment of the Supreme Court in, um, in July, I think the roots of that come from the thinking that has emerged from the Supreme Court, which originated in June 2014, in the handling by the Supreme Court of a case against the, Greater, the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police, where the Supreme Court uh, attached much greater significance to the vesting of provisions uh, in relation to the uh, convention rights uh, by using their term, in accordance with law. And that judgment post-dated the passage of that legislation by the Scottish Parliament earlier in 2014. So in answering the point about the, the legal strength of our arguments, I would say to Liz Smith that having had the bill considered and challenges dismissed by the inner and outer houses of the Court of Session, uh, I think that is a strong vindication of the legal position that Parliament took. And I've cited the basis upon which I think there has been an emergence of thinking within the Supreme Court which opens up what I would consider to be a new point of analysis on convention rights in accordance with law, which post-dated uh, the uh, passage of the legislation here in this Parliament. And on the final point, and I think this is a very substantial point in relation to um, well-being and welfare, because it relates very directly to one of the other terms that Liz Smith used, which was the question of threshold. And I accept, and the Supreme Court judgment raised this issue, raises this issue with us, that if we are to... I, I, I don't take the view that it should just be about welfare. I believe it should be about well-being because that's at the heart of GERFET, because that's what provides for the early intervention activity to address difficulties that young people face and to intervene early to try to avert them becoming more serious issues. But there has to be appropriate threshold. And that is the issue which now has to be examined as part of the analysis that I have undertaken. So I hope that provides the clarity of what will be in the minds of the Minister for Childcare in Early Years and myself as we go about the process of ensuring that this legislation is, giving, is given absolutely secure foundations. But with it, it fulfills its purpose, which is to be of value and as an asset to protect the well-being of children in Scotland and to make sure we can deliver the best outcomes for every single one of them. Because in that respect, I am an, un, I am an unapologetic advocate of getting it right for every child and it will drive everything that I do as the Education Secretary in this Parliament. Ian Gray, please, to be followed by Rona Mackay. I also thank the Deputy First Minister for early sight of his statement. The Deputy First Minister knows that Labour supports the principle of the name person policy. The measures he's taking to resolve the issues over information sharing are therefore welcome. But exactly because we want this to work, we have to face up to the fact that this policy has lost the confidence of many Scottish families. And fixing that is as important as fixing the inf information sharing section of the bill. Responding to the requirements of the Supreme Court judgment is a necessary but not sufficient response. To that end, we have suggested that we use the opportunity of this pause to remove 16 and 17 year olds from the scope of the policy. To include them was a mistake. To many people, it seems absurd given that a 16 year old can vote, marry, work, pay tax, all as an adult. To remove them would be a strong signal that while the government is not surrendering on named person policy, it is listening and not only to the Supreme Court. I simply ask again, will the Deputy First Minister undertake to remove 16 and 17 year olds from the scope of the legislation? Deputy First Minister. First of all, can I thank you and Gray for 
the, 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 the welcome that he's given to the provisions that I've set out today. And also, can I agree with him that uh, the, there is a need to gain confidence in the named person policy? And uh, the way in which I have set out the argument for named person policy and where, it, where the named person policy and where it originates from, from within the policy framework of getting it right for every child, is uh, one illustration of how I intend to try to build that confidence uh, about the application of this policy. And Mr Gray said that he didn't think addressing the uh, provisions and the points made by the Supreme Court, uh, it was necessary but not sufficient. Um, I think it is necessary, but I think it's also significant in boosting confidence in the policy, because if we satisfactorily address the issue which I closed my remarks to Liz Smith about, about the issue of threshold, then I think we may uh, begin to address some of the issues that have been raised about the policy, because it, what will allow us to do is to respond again adequately, I think, to what the Supreme Court have asked us to do, to address specifically the issue of proportionality in the application of the policy and the judgments that are made within the policy. So I think we can go a long way by properly and fully addressing the requirements of the Supreme Court to build confidence in the policy. Now, when Mr Gray set out over the summer his call for me to, um, to look again at the provision for 16 and 17 year olds, I indicated at that stage I would be prepared to, to consider that issue and I remain of that view, that I will consider it. But I do make two specific points to Mr Gray on this issue. The first is that in the, re the report from Childline today, Childline re revealed that 30% of the contact with Childline is from 16 to 18 year olds, expressing their vulnerability to that particular medium. So whilst I understand and I accept the points that Mr Gray makes about the fact that 16 and 17 year olds are able to vote and they're able to join the armed forces and they can do lots of other things. But there's also a lot of 16 and 17 year olds that remain very vulnerable. And we have to address that fact in our consideration. And the second point I would make is that clearly the, the Parliament did not legislate for 16 and 17 year olds to come within the scope of the named person provision on a whim. It was done because the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child defines a child as a young person up to the age of 18. And Mr Gray will know from his long experience in these issues that uh, the government from times to times and parliament from time to times comes un in for criticism for not fulfilling international standards and points of recognition that are important in the policy process. So I put those points on the record, um, but I will give consideration to the issue that Mr Gray has raised because I have made clear in my statement that my determination is to proceed on this uh, issue with the objective of building consensus and to building broad agreement around this provision, and that will be the approach that I take in taking forward this policy. Thank you. Before I call uh, others, I have 11 members wishing to ask questions. Of course, I want to get them all in, so that will depend on the length of the questions and to some extent as well, on the length of the answers. So try to do your best. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Ms Mackay, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I couldn't agree more with the Cabinet Secretary's concern about the debilitating impact of the peddling of misinformation on the morale and confidence of practitioners who day in and day out do one of the hardest jobs there is, that of supporting vulnerable children and families. Does the Cabinet Secretary therefore agree with me that the Tories should tone down their hysterical rhetoric on name person and accept the judgment of the Supreme Court which stated that the intent of the legislation is unquestionably legitimate and benign? Deputy First Minister. Uh, President Officer, I, I, I think the, the, the Supreme Court had an opportunity to look at uh, the, all of the provisions here and they've come to their judgment. I think what, what I'm trying to do is to take forward the, um, the approach that is required to ensure this legislation can be implemented as quickly as possible and to make sure that the public servants who are keen to make sure that they can provide the best possible connected services for the young people of Scotland and addressing the needs are able to proceed on this basis. So um, I will uh, press on.
in the fashion that I've set out. And I hope that we can have a political debate around this subject, which is focused on addressing the, uh, the, the issues of substance that come out of the Supreme Court judgment and uh, work to resolve those as speedily as we possibly can do. Thank you very much. I call Adam Tompkins to be followed by Jenny Gilruud. Mr Tompkins. Thank you very much. And I thank the Deputy First Minister for his uh, statement and indeed for keeping uh, Parliament appropriately uh, informed during the course of the recess. The Deputy First Minister has identified that it was the information sharing provisions of the named persons scheme that the Supreme Court ruled unlawful in its judgment in July. And he's explained that he proposes to remedy these defects, even if he said nothing about how he proposes to do this. But I say to the Deputy First Minister, it's not just about thresholds, it's also about definition, and in particular, the definition uh, of well-being. Um, the uh, Supreme Court ruled uh, that the relevant provisions were not in accordance with law because the Supreme Court found that they lacked clarity and certainty. And the lack of clarity and the lack of certainty goes to the heart of this question of well-being. But the Supreme Court said a lot more in its judgment. It did not focus on information sharing alone. The court stated that even after the information sharing provisions are sorted out, the named person scheme is still in danger of constituting a disproportionate and therefore an unlawful interference with family life in many cases. Paragraph 100 of the judgment, the court states that the operation of the scheme is likely often to be disproportionate. Those are the court's words. And that's even after the information sharing provisions are rewritten so that they are in accordance with law. So my question is, why has the Deputy First Minister's statement today failed to address this aspect of the court's ruling? Deputy First Minister. Well, I think, the, I, I think, well, I, I think my statement has addressed that issue because I've acknowledged the importance of addressing the issue of thresholds and proportionality. And the, I, I, I take a different view to, um, but I'm not sure I do take a different view to Mr. Tompkins about the question of definition. Um, I agree that the court says that the provisions uh, need to be set out in accordance with law. That is now a, essentially a habitual requirement of Supreme Court judgments, and that's something that postdates the passage of the legislation. So the definition of well-being is, uh, you know, we have defined well-being in the guidance documents that the government has set out. The Supreme, Court gov the Supreme Court had that draft guidance in front of it. But guidance does not constitute law. I accept that point. So, the, the, so essentially, what the, if, if, I, if I can perhaps do a dangerous thing of trying to summarise what the Supreme Court judgment was saying, it was almost saying, get your guidance into, into law and then that's you, that's you address the issue, if I can, I, it's perhaps not Supreme Court language, but that is, that is what I would take from the, 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 the provisions that they've put in place. So there is a job of work to be done to define that, I accept that, and that will then make it in accordance with law, which will then address the issues that the Supreme Court has raised with us. And that is, uh, and, and the issue of proportionality is important because it will address directly the question that Mr. Tompkins raises about on what occasions and in what circumstances might the information provision, uh, the information sharing provisions be utilised. There are of course, and this is why I set out the policy position within the context of GERFEC, a really very important point, which I know is, 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 is perhaps not part of the the narrative that um, has been used in this debate to criticise a named person. There are plenty of families that want to go to a named person to get the support they require, because people generally don't come to me at my surgeries to tell me how well connected the public services have been. They generally come to my surgeries to say, could you get the public services better connected for me, Mr Swain? So there will be an opportunity for members of the public to use this service to get this, the, the support that they require to assist their young people, and that, I think, is a good thing. And thank you. Jenny Gilruth, to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Ms Gilruth, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement regarding an intensive engagement programme. Can he provide more detail about how he intends to involve health visitors, teachers, parents, carers, and, crucially, children and young people themselves in that activity? Uh, presiding officer, the, First Minister. The, 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 uh, the Minister and I will spend a considerable amount of time over the course of the next few months in direct engagement with um, a variety of professionals, but also with parents, with young people, uh, and also with people who have been critical of the policy to find ways in which we might be able to address uh, 
the substantive issues. Um, there were some people that I can't reach in this who just are implacably opposed to it. And uh, you know, even with the persuasive skills that I would like to think I have, there'll be some people I won't manage to reach. But I do hope we can have a fair climate to address the issues raised in the Supreme Court, and the Minister and I will engage in that substantively, substantively to make sure that, that is the case before come back, coming back to Parliament with uh, further detail on how we will take forward the legislation. Thank you, Daniel Johnson, followed by James Dornan. Mr. Jo Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, following on from my colleague Ian Gray's question, I, I would welcome the Deputy First Minister's acknowledgement that, that addressing the point of confidence and faith that people have in this policy is as important as addressing the legal point. And to that end, teachers and health visitors all along have raised their concerns about the impact of named person on the time that they have to do their main job. So now that we have a pause, will Mr Swinney use it to find the resource and implement it so that these crucial professionals have the time and resource available to do the main job of caring and educating our children? First Minister. Well, if I take the, 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 the last few words of Mr Johnson's question about um, teachers having the opportunity to care for and educate our children, that's exactly what I want our teachers to be able to do, which is why I'm investing so much of my time in ensuring that they are liberated from bureaucracy to enable them to do that. But when I go around the schools of Scotland, I talk to teachers whose conversation with me is not just about educational attainment. It's about their judgment about children when they walk in the door in the morning and what they need, what support, what nurture they need before they can even think about any learning. And in some schools I've gone into, I've been overwhelmed by the empathy and frankly, the love of teachers for children. And the first port of call is to put the toaster on as opposed to to get a book out. So I don't think we should try to compartmentalize this, that somehow the named person is an added burden onto teachers. Teachers are looking at the, at the children for whom they are responsible every minute of the day, trying to establish how, what support they require, what difficulties they are facing, how they can assist them them to fulfill their potential and we should congratulate our teaching profession for doing exactly that. What I don't want is for us to have a, a, a debate which suggests that somehow um, being a named person is not something that almost comes naturally to the role of the teaching profession in uh, assessing the well-being uh, of young people in their care and uh, taking every step they can to enhance uh, the well-being of young people as a consequence of their productive intervention. James Dornan, to be followed by Alison Johnson. Mr Dornan, please. Thank you, President Officer. What reassurance can the Cabinet Secretary give parents and families about their interest in the process? What will happen if they are unhappy with the named person service? And conversely, what might happen should a family refuse to engage with the service? And as a convener of the Education and Skills Committee, can I ask what role the Cabinet Secretary sees that committee having uh, playing in this, this, as this progresses through Parliament? Deputy First Minister. I'm sure it's not for me to specify the agenda of the Education and Skills Committee, but I'm sure they'll tell me <laughs> they'll tell me what they want um, is, uh, I suspect, the way it will work. And uh, I'm obviously very happy to engage with the committee in any way on these questions. In relation to Mr Dornan's point on um, the, the role of parents, clearly the, 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 the provisions of law um, in, in this respect have not been um, challenged by the, 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 the court, uh, with the exception that they suggest that we could better specify the opportunities there are for parents to essentially opt out of the provisions of the named person. And that's obviously an issue that I will reflect on as part of the conversations that we take forward. And I will have adequate opportunity to discuss these issues with parents, groups and representatives around the country. Alison Johnson to be followed by John Mason. Ms Johnson, please. Thank you. Um, I welcome the fact that the Supreme Court judgment has moved the debate on. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that those opposing the principle of named person are on the wrong side of the judgment and that what we must all focus on now is addressing the shortcomings regarding information sharing? Deputy First Minister. I, I, I agree with that point. The, uh, the Supreme Court did not strike down the legislation. Um, they described its aims as unquestionably legitimate and benign. <laughs> and uh, there are issues, and I've confronted them openly to Parliament today, 
uh, with the information sharing provisions. Uh, uh, within minutes of the judgment, I acknowledge the government would resolve these issues, would have to resolve these issues, and we now must concentrate on doing that. And I've set out a process to Parliament which will enable us to do exactly that. And I look forward to dialogue with members of all parties about how we can most effectively take forward those provisions. John Mason, to be followed by Tavish Scott. Mr Mason, please. Thank you. I wonder if the government can confirm that it, it is essential that every child and every family in Scotland should be able to get help and advice and support if they need it. And therefore, it is absolutely essential that, every, that there is a named person available for every child and every family, just as there is an ambulance there available for every child and every family. Deputy First Minister. I, th I think that's a, that's a very fair and realistic way of bringing this policy to life that this is a resource that is available for, for families to call upon if they require that assistance. And as I, to repeat one of the comments I made earlier on, I generally don't meet people who are, um, uh, who are coming to see me because they feel public services have been well connected. They often come to see me because they need me to try to, to weave those services together for them. So the point that Mr Mason makes is a fair point, that the resources there to be utilised by families to ensure the well-being of their children is most effectively supported by the public sector in any way we can. Thank you, Tabby Scott. We followed by Gil Patterson. Mr. Thank Scott. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, and can I thank the Deputy First Minister for an advance sight of his statement. I'm sure he's familiar with Clause 95 of the Supreme Court judgment, which says parents will be given the impression that they must accept the advice or services which they are offered. Their failure to cooperate with such a plan will be taken to be evidence of a risk of harm. Now, both as a minister, but also, if I may say, as a father, does he find that as concerning as I do? And does that not show the need for the scope of the uh, examination of this policy that he's going to undertake in the coming three months, a policy that is now going to be delayed a year, uh, to, to recognise exactly that point, to recognise the concerns of teachers and and of health visitors, given the 200 risk indicators that he talked about in the debate earlier in the summer, and therefore the need for the scope of that inquiry to recognise all those points and address them very fully. Deputy First well, Minister. I think M M Mr Scott will understand the, uh, the, the importance that I attach to the democratic decisions of Parliament. Parliament has legislated for this Act. It has put in place these provisions. They've been tested by two courts in Scotland and they've been tested by a third court in the, uh, in the United Kingdom and the Supreme Court, the two courts in Scotland have said this legislation, the legal challenges are, are, are not substantiated and the Supreme Court has raised particular issues with us about information sharing provisions and Mr Scott will understand um, my democratic point that I think it is important because I want to operate within the rule of law and because I want to operate within the scope of uh, acting on behalf of Parliament's democratic decisions, uh, why I'm focusing this on addressing the issues raised by the Supreme Court in their judgment. Now, I think the point that Mr Scott makes about the provision of parents is a point that um, is uh, illustrated by the Supreme Court's view that the sense that individuals can opt out of this um, is not perhaps as well understood or as well expressed as it could be. And uh, I will certainly consider issues of that nature. But I stress that uh, we must be respectful of the democratic decisions of Parliament, which in 2014 decided this would be the shape of the legislation and the Supreme Court have identified the areas where we specifically need to address that point. Gil Patterson to be followed by Monica Lynn and Mr Patterson. Uh, many thanks, Presiding Officer. As a long-standing MSP who remembers well supporting this policy as an opposition MSP when introduced by the Labour Liberal Democrat administration, I welcome that the Cabinet Secretary focused so much of his statement on the wider uh, GIRFIC policy. One of the most important aspects of the legislation in Part 3, which requires the local authorities to plan children's services effectively, can you highly advise when this will come into effect? Deputy First Minister. The, the, uh, I welcome the, the point that um, Mr Patterson has made because I think it, it does illustrate the fact that um, many of us um, have on, on, in both our capacities as opposition, as a, as a long-standing opposition member as well, 
Um, I, I supported this policy and have advocated this approach for many years, and I uh, was enthusiastically supporting our predecessors in bringing forward this policy framework. So it's important that we, it is set within that long-term policy of getting it right for every child. Um, it, to answer Mr. Patterson's specific point, part three will come into effect on the 7th of October, um, which requires local authorities and relevant health boards to have the first children's services plans in place from the 1st of April 2017. And those plans will cover a three-year period uh, from that date. Thank you. Monica Leonard, be followed by Fulton McGregor. Ms. Leonard. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is vitally important that the Scottish Government seeks to build the confidence and trust of parents and young people across the country, as well as staff on the front line. And I'm pleased that the Deputy First Minister recognises this. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister uh, how the Scottish Government intends to engage young people during the consultation, and will this include 16 and 17 year olds specifically? Deputy First Minister. It, it, it certainly will do, and um, we will take steps through a number of the channels of, of discussion and communication that we have. We're very lucky to have a whole range of different organisations in Scotland that are uh, well connected with young people in Scotland. Um, we have various forum, well, there are various forums that exist in which that can happen, and um, ministers and officials will engage very substantively on those points. And, and certainly the issue that um, uh, Monica Lennon specifically raised about 16, 17 year olds is a material issue for us to, to consult with that group, specifically recognising the fact that you know, I can understand the perspective that's been put forward by, uh, by Mr Gray uh, on this issue, but equally Monica Lennon will understand the, the perspective that I see from the data about the degree of vulnerability that exists among 16 and 17 year olds as well. Uh, but I do give her the assurance that we will complete that exercise. Fulton McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer. I think it's important to go back to basics in this and remember exactly why the legislation matters. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore outline what difference this policy will make to the well-being of children, but particularly Scotland's most vulnerable? Deputy First Minister. It, it, well, I, th I think it, it, it is important that we go back to the roots of this policy because I encounter um, around the country, and actually I was, at a, I was at a school this morning um, in Glasgow, which was a, a splendid example of how we need to identify at the earliest possible opportunity um, weaknesses and deficiencies that young people may be facing and to address them and to intervene as quickly as possible. Uh, I met a wonderful young man this morning who went to this particular school um, when he faced acute difficulties, but the early intervention and the support that he has had has made a transformative impact on that young man. And it was because of good early intervention that that has been achieved and a tremendous amount of care and nurture in the intervening years. So I think that the point that Mr. McGregor makes is a substantive one, that we need to take um, early steps to support young people as effective as we can and to ensure that they are able to overcome difficulties and obstacles that they may face. And that is at the heart of the thinking behind getting it right for every child and will underpin uh, the development of the policy as we take this forward. John Scott, I just squeeze you in. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary acknowledges that the judgment of the Supreme Court, which is to be welcomed. However, in response to Liz Smith's question, the Deputy First Minister failed to make clear the position of local authorities, if I heard him correctly, who, acting in good faith in piloting this scheme, may have breached ECHR regulation while following Scottish Government advice and guidelines. Where do piloting local authorities stand in terms of liability if they are pursued on the Supreme Court ruling, having followed Scottish Government advice and guidance? Deputy First Minister. I, I, I'm afraid I, uh, I have to... Um, I don't agree with... Um, well, I wouldn't agree with Mr Scott that I didn't answer the question because I answered it very fully, I thought. But in what I said in my answer to Liz Smith and what I said in my statement was that... Um, any local authority, the, the provisions, what has been identified as being deficient uh, are provisions in the Children and Young People Act 2014. Any local, and that's not come into effect yet, any local authority providing a service up until the passage of that legislation or up until today must be acting in accordance with the Data Protection Act 1998 and the Human Rights Act 1998. 
and that any legal advice that went to local authorities in relation to the design of their schemes would have to be compatible with those two provisions. So that's the, that, that was the answer I gave to Liz Smith at the, and to her first question. It's the answer I gave in my statement. It's the answer I give to Mr. Scott. And it's the only answer I can give because that's the legal framework within which local authorities are required to operate. Thank you. That concludes questions to Deputy First Minister. Before we move to the next item of business, I'll allow the front bench to take their places. Thank you.